Welcome to Around the 412 for the very first time, part of the DK Pittsburgh Sports Podcast Network. I am Tyler, and with me as always is Smitty. What is up, man? Man, is that good to hear. Yeah, it, it's been a little bit, com- a little while coming. Yeah, it has, and I think we'd be remiss if we didn't kick off our first show on the network, giving a shout out to DK, to his wife Dolly, to Eddie Provident, the multimedia director here, really overseeing this whole project for DK, um, for for making this happen. You know, not just for us, but the entire podcasting community. It's a huge step for Pittsburgh, the way that people get their sports talk. So. I'm just really excited to talk about this stuff that we're going to talk about, and I'm excited about the time of year it is. It's fall. Football is going now. I mean, that's why mm-hmm. we're repping the BYU shirts right now. We're not going to talk about BYU on here, but this is our way of representing them on game day. Pitt also kicking off their season with UMass today. Um, the best part about all this this time of year is the Pirates are about to be put out of their misery, and the season's going to come to an end, and we just now look forward to the future, which is the only thing that you're looking forward to if you're a Pirate fan. But hockey train camp right around the corner. One week from tomorrow, the Steelers will be playing football. Yeah, it's a very exciting time, not only with sports. The weather's starting to cool down the past few days. has been amazing. I'm just really excited for this time of year, getting into football. It's it's it, You feel it in the city. I feel like you feel it with the Steelers. It's it's We're like a week away. Yeah. And you know, if anybody listens to the show, too, it's funny you mentioned like the weather thing, because I feel like we're always so outspoken about how we just we hate summer weather. Oh, it <laughs> sucks. <laughs> I think anybody that likes summer is insane. I'll be honest. Once you're not in school anymore, like what's the point of summer? There really isn't is, is one because it's just being hot. Let's talk about some sports. What do you think? Yeah. All right. So let's start with the pens. A couple things to talk about here. A couple interesting PTO deals handed out by the pens, if you will. Brian Boyle. And Matt Bartkowski, who's a local guy, by the way. Uh, let's talk about Brian Boyle first, because I feel like he's the one that's the more intriguing one here. Don't know if he has anything left in the tank, right? 36 years old. I don't. He didn't even play in the NHL, did he, last year? Uh, not that, that I did. know of. Yeah. I, 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 maybe it was for COVID reasons. I'm not sure. Yeah, but. true. Um, but anyway, 36 years old. The only reason that I'm saying it's more intriguing is because there's so much up in the air with Geno. Uh, you know, potentially not being able to go at the beginning of the season. Could we see Brian Boyle actually make this team as the fourth line center to start? Yeah, I think we could because coming in on a tryout, you're going into the season uh, really competing probably for Evan Rodriguez's spot on that fourth line center because that's pretty much who everybody is slotting in because there really isn't a lot of center depth on this team, which is the reason that they kept Jeff Carter in the expansion draft. And so you would you would think at the least you would probably get a depth piece out of them and hopefully he could actually turn into a decent fourth line center. And with the depth, that's so valuable for the Penguins because there's not really a lot of center depth on this team in general. And you already have Geno out going into the season. So once you start the season, you can't really bank on none of those centers getting hurt. So if you're able to have at least that fifth center, that would be really good for the Pens. Yeah, just adds depth. And then Bart Kowski, I mean, you brought up, we were looking at his numbers right before we oh, started man. recording. His scoring numbers one, are rough. Yeah, he only played in one game last year and it was like, astronomically terrible like if he kept that up for a season it'd be like the lowest of all time um but it career-wise even it's not good like he has not been a very serviceable player he's not going to be better than like the eighth defenseman here if he i I don't see him making the team to be honest with you i think it's just like a cool storyline the fact that he is a local kid coming for a pto at the end of his career with the pens but i don't see this as anything more than that no especially when i mean you've got mark friedman and chad ruido who's going to compete for that like sixth defenseman spot and then you mm-hmm. ha- also have ricola still on the team i just don't really see a way that he's going to make the team because that's two defensemen already that's not going to be in the top six yeah so right. well you know what you brought up Ricola. i mean i didn't have this on here to talk about him but w- what is the plan with him like what is Yuso Ricola's role for the pittsburgh penguins because like going back to last year even it was just like this guy the only value he's bringing to the penguins is as a trade chip but like they just keep bringing him back honestly i have no idea what value he brings especially with the emergence last year of poj we don't really know if he's going to start with the team this year if he's going to start down in wilkesbury whether he's going to that is yeah yeah and whether he's going to come up during the season but even with him you still have marcus Pedersen, brian dumlin and mike mathis is still there on the left side you would assume that on the depth chart they would probably prefer poj over ricola Mm -hmm. and then i know for a fact that mike sullivan just for some reason does not like ricola So I don't really know why he's still on this team, to be honest. He's just a guy that keep coming back for depth, I guess. But he really has no value here just because he's never plays. Let me ask you a question that kind of can segue into this this final thing to talk about with the Pens. 
Are you more surprised by the fact that they didn't address goaltending other than the other thing to talk about here with a two-way deal for Louis Domingue or the fact that they didn't trade one of Matheson or Pedersen? I'm more surprised that they didn't address goaltending. And the only reason being, I think it's harder to trade one of those defensemen because you have to have a partner that wants them. And looking at the contracts, there's probably not many people that want them. Now, I'm fine with Marcus Pedersen, and I think you and I have been very well-spoken about how we like his game and we think he adds value to this team, contrary to a popular belief in Pittsburgh. Um, And so I'm keeping one of the two. I'd keep Pedersen. But when it comes to Mike Matheson, I mean, that, what, 4.8 for the next five years or so, Mm -hmm. that's just not a contract that many teams are going to look at and be like, yeah, I want that player. So I think that's where I'm more surprised that they didn't address the goaltending, especially because after this last playoff series, you saw that was just the glaring issue of this team. Everywhere else was fine. The goaltending was the reason that they lost that series to the Islanders. Well, what we always say with Marcus Patterson, the best thing about him is the way that he helps John Marino be the best version of John Marino, right? It's kind of like the Brian Dumo and Chris Letang thing. So I can absolutely understand them keeping Marcus Patterson, and I'd be worried about them dealing him, but I am surprised that he's still on this team. I definitely expected him to be traded and then figured out, but what it shows me is maybe the Pens themselves are also worried about what John Marino is going to look like away from him. And that's why they're keeping Marcus Pedersen on this roster. Because that was the contract that they could move from that left side, open up a spot for POJ, but they chose not to do it. If you're trading Mike Matheson, you're probably attaching another asset to do it. And he wasn't bad enough really to justify that taking place. Like he wasn't so bad that he was, it wasn't a Jack Johnson situation where you felt like you had to buy him out or attach another asset to get rid of him. Matt Hunwick, I'll go back to that as well, where we lost Connor Sherry for nothing because they had Mm -hmm. to attach him to get rid of Matt Hunwick. So I guess that just shows that definitely the organization views Marcus Pedersen a lot higher higher than a lot of fans, not us, because we like Marcus Pedersen. But then the last thing there, okay, so Louis Domingue on a two-way deal, does he do anything for you? I mean, does this move the needle at all in terms of the goaltending? Honestly, position? I just view it as a depth goaltender move. I yeah. don't think he's going to compete for the starting job, definitely not over Jari. And then I don't really even think he's going to compete for the backup job with Casey DeSmith. I think that Casey DeSmith is a very solid backup goaltender. And I've said so for a couple years now. I, I, I was very spoken about how I would have protected... Casey DeSmith over Tristan Jari for the sole reason of I think he's a more valuable backup than Tristan Jari was as a starter. Mm -hmm. So I don't really think that he is going to really compete to be on this team. I think he's going to start out in Wilkes-Barre and just pretty much stay there unless there's an injury to one of the goaltenders. I think the only thing to watch with him, and and I don't think that this will happen, I would say the only way that this could maybe impact the NHL roster is if the plan is to see what the Smith's trade value is. Like, like you said, it's not going to be anything. It doesn't change Jari's situation at all. Probably doesn't change to Smith's, but I would say that that's the only thing to really monitor in terms of the NHL goaltending situation is if they want to maybe kick the tires and see what the Smith's value would be in a trade. Yeah, and I'm wondering what teams would actually want the Smith. Like, would you trade for him as a backup? That's not really a common trade in the NHL. You typically trade for a starting goaltender. Mm-hmm. Now, maybe there's a... A team this year that just gets the injury bug really bad and they really need a goaltender and then they look to a guy like Casey DeSmith. Right. But who knows? Yeah, I'm saying down the line. Before yeah. the season, you don't see that. I think at the trade deadline, you you see sometimes teams acquiring backup goaltending just depending on how their situation is at that point in the season. But yeah, I don't see that being a move that would happen prior to the season kicking off. Yeah, there's a lot of variables going into that because you'd have to see how Louis Domingue's playing, how Casey DeSmith is playing. But if Casey DeSmith looks like he has been the past couple of years, I just really wouldn't even want to let him go. Even if you had good value out of him, I think he's too valuable to back up. Right. Well, that's about it for the Pens. So we got a lot more sports to talk about. Speaking of kickoff, we're going to talk about the Steelers when we come back right after this break. It's around the 4 and 2 on DK Pittsburgh Sports Podcast Network. to around 412 on DK Pittsburgh Sports Podcast Network. I am Smitty. With me, as always, is my co-host, Tyler. Uh, let's talk about the Steelers a little bit. Um, definitely, definitely just gave us a new topic to talk about, so thank you, Pittsburgh Steelers. Trading for Akello Witherspoon, the cornerback from Seattle. Uh, what a mixed bag this guy is. I don't know if you dove into him at all to see what the numbers have been like over the past few seasons, um, but like graded out, and you know, I'm about to say the words that no Steeler fan likes to hear, PFF, uh, graded out as PFF's number five corner last year, fourth best in coverage. However, as recently as 2018, he was their fifth worst 
corner, according to their grading system. So this guy is a mixed bag. Uh, just a brief summary of what I've seen. He's gotten better as a tackler, but that was like his biggest weakness coming in. But he's six foot three. He's long. I think he can excel in like just an outside role. So it's going to be interesting to see what that means for a guy like James Pierre opposite of Joe Hayden. Does this take away James Pierre's role as that starting outside guy opposite of Hayden? Um, I mean, what do you think about this move? Does it signal anything for you other than just depth for the secondary? That is the exact thing I thought whenever I saw this trade. I was like, okay, this isn't like a huge name that they're bringing in. I think that this is something that they needed to address because one of the areas after the 53-man roster was released was like, okay, we're only keeping four corners. That's really mm-hmm. not going to fly, especially when one of those corners is Justin Lane because we know the history with him. <laughs> and um, Keith Butler was outspoken talking about the four corners thing. Like, You don't really hear coaches say that, but he was like, yeah, we're going to add to the room still, essentially. Yeah, so I think this is, at the very least, it's a depth move. I still expect James Pierre to start out, but we have to see how Witherspoon is going to play with the Steelers. If he excels, then he could take over that starting role, and then you would still have the option of Cam Sutton or James Pierre. It, it, it's just good for the team when you have more options at a position and cornerback was probably if not one it's probably one or two for where they needed to add depth yeah it's funny because like okay so they gave up a 2023 fifth to Seattle by the way he was he just signed with Seattle this offseason like yeah. that He's shows you how the 49ers quickly Niners before this yeah that shows you how quickly he fell out of favor there they made a move uh for Sidney Jones from Jacksonville to bring him in and you just saw Witherspoon just tumble on the depth chart down to the point where he was just a forgotten commodity for them so I'm hopeful that we get the San Fran version of Akella Witherspoon um that we saw in in 2020 even 2019 he was decent too um but you mentioned like one of the spots that they needed to add something at was definitely corner. The other spot that we're really worried about, even if they don't add somebody else or it doesn't seem like their plan is to do so is the offensive line. Um, that kind of ties in with this too, though, because like everybody's clamoring for Joe Haig to end up playing over Chukwama Korafor because he's the better run blocker. He had a pretty good preseason. The thing is with Haig, if they, if he plays more than 25% of the snaps in three games, then there's no chance of the Steelers being able to recoup that comp pick that they got for, or they're getting projected they get from losing Filer in mm-hmm. free agency. Um, but if he doesn't play that amount of snaps, they could still get that fifth round pick because Witherspoon essentially cancels that out for right now, that fifth round comp right. they were getting for Filer. If Hay doesn't meet that minimum of snaps, then they can still get that fifth round pick. So is that playing in the Steelers' mind at all? Like, Maybe we shouldn't use Hague unless we literally like really have to. I guess that's really is what you value as the Steelers. Are you valuing valuing what do you get best out of this team this year? And if Haig is the best option, then maybe you go with that. Especially because we've talked about all offseason. Like this is really the the, the last They're dance. They're going all in. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know. The, the last dance has been thrown around by Joe Hayden. S- Joe Hayden. <laughs> it's thrown by Aaron Rodgers, Devontae Adams. All the people are using that term. But I feel like if you're looking at it that way, then what really what value is a fifth round pick versus putting the best offensive line option you yeah, have out it there? It can't play into the Steelers' decision. I'm bringing that up just like to see what what your opinion on it is. But yeah, there's no way if they feel like Joe Hayes is the best option for them in one of those tackle spot right tackle spot, uh, then he's going to play. Uh, I mm-hmm. would just really be worried about that. I mean, I saw him in Tampa. He fell out. Of, he had to start one game because Donovan Smith being hurt, and he was so bad in that game he wasn't even the backup when Donovan Smith came back. Like. Yeah, I, I, I just think I think they should roll with Okorafor into the season, see how he does in games, mm-hmm. because he, he had the experience from being the tackle last year, but I don't think that the leash is going to be that long on some of these linemen. I just don't think they can afford to be, because the line is really the critical part of this offense. We know the skill positions guys are so good. We know that Ben, he, he seems to be good. Our good friend Eddie Provena has brought up how the only issue he thinks is his knees. So I'm expecting that the line is to what's going to be helping him with that. And I, I think that that is probably the most integral part of this offense going into the season, because the line is what drives everything moving forward. Yeah, and the only reason we're talking about one of these tackle spots for Joe Haig or Jaquan Wakura for switching from the left side to the right side, it's not just because Dan Moore has had a good preseason and training camp. It's just simply not. He would still be the backup right now if that were the case. However, Zach Banner, starting the season on IR, still coming back from that ACL injury. Um, I don't I don't know if it's just like a re-injury or if he just they threw him out there and realized, okay, this guy's not ready yet. 
Like, I don't know what it is there, but he's starting the season on IR, so he's going to miss at least three games. Same thing with Stephon Tuitt, Anthony McFarland. I mean, Stephon Tuitt, you could see the writing on the wall there. And when they moved Okorafor back to the right side, I was like, okay, like, something's going on here with Banner, too. Mm -hmm. We haven't seen a ton of him in the preseason. That was kind of to be expected. But now, to see this happen and looking at the state of this offensive line, a unit that came in with a lot of question marks, they haven't really answered anything. They've actually added more questions to that. Um, if it were me, this this money that they still have left over would be going to address something on that offensive line. I know Mitchell Schwartz is still out there. And, I mean, I don't think the Steelers are going to do it. But... If you could, would you add somebody still to this offensive line? Yes. I just have no confidence in the depth of this this group. And I, I think that the Steelers are really lucky that Dan Moore Jr. is actually performing well. Because mm-hmm. if he wasn't, what would they be doing? Yeah. You would well, be rolling said. with Okor for and Haig to start the season if he was not yeah. performing well because Banner's hurt. Fourth round pick in the 2021 draft is kind of, it's at offensive line. It's tackle spots especially mm-hmm. is kind of like being like a second or third round pick any other year like it was the best yeah, tackle it was a class really deep seen tackle draft come out in a while so yeah the Steelers were definitely fortunate that Dan Moore Jr. was a player there that was you know that was there for them in the fourth but he's still not a guy that you want to see start day one and I'm kind of thinking the same thing about Kendrick Green like great athlete if he gets to the second he can get to the second level and he puts people down but like I, I'm thinking like this guy gets overpowered at time not the best anchor I just don't think that he's ready quite yet just four starts in college at the position in an ideal situation, I don't think either one of those guys are starting this year, but you look at what's behind them. I don't want to see J.C. Hassenhauer. I was going to say, I remember that at the end of the last season, we were just roasting J.C. Hassenhauer. And yeah. Do we really want him to start this no, season? No, absolutely not. It, that's why like Kendrick Green is definitely their best option at center. But it's like, if that's your best option, at least to start. Again, I'm still very hopeful for what this line can be. I think that Dodson, Green, and Dan Moore are a great foundation going forward for the mm-hmm. offensive line. But to play right now, and Kevin Dotson, I'm fine with even playing right now. Yeah. Trey Turner, I'm okay with. So it's really both attack spots and center that I'm like, uh, I'm not sure how they're going to open up the season. As time goes on, they continue. And that's the biggest thing, too. It's like not even do they just lack experience in games. These guys haven't played together in the training camp in the preseason. There's just a lack of reps there. Yeah, that's what we were talking about all preseason in these games. They haven't had the what was we call the projected starting line. Mm-hmm. They, they've really never played together and haven't been able to mesh because you get this chemistry together when you play, and they just haven't been able to have that. And with Banner getting hurt, they're, not, they're still not going to have that. Right. So let, let's kind of segue this into the final thing to talk about the Steelers. 53-man roster comes out. It's not going to be the final roster that they go into the season with, I don't think. Uh, right now, still carrying six middle linebackers, which is a surprise to me because even with the move for Witherspoon, it's Henry Mondu who loses his 53-man roster spot, mm-hmm. not a guy like Ulysses Gilbert or somebody in the middle of that defense. Um, so were there any surprises to you on the 53-man roster, You know, both for and against, like, oh, wow, this guy made it and he shouldn't have, or like, oh, wow, this guy made it. I'm glad that he did, but I didn't expect him to. I wouldn't say there's many surprises of the, oh, wow, this guy made it and I'm glad that he did. I think mainly it's like the names you just mentioned, like Ulysses Gilbert, Marcus Allen. I was surprised that both of those guys made the 53-man roster. I think maybe one of them, and if it was going to be one, I would assume it would have been Marcus Allen. Yeah, he's been a special team stud. Yeah, so so realistically, Ulysses Gilbert is the one that I was really shocked that... He, because not only has he not played that well, he's just never been healthy over his career as a Steeler. It's a shame, man. Great dude. It just seems like since he got that back injury, his rookie year, um, he just like it just took away all his athleticism, and that's what he came into the league to be. Is like everybody talks about how great of an athlete sideline to sideline Devin Bush is. Like Ulysses Gilbert was that exact same prototype. Yeah like model of player. He's not the same talent as Devin Bush, Mm -hmm. but that's his style of game. And it just looks like all his athleticism was just depleted with that most recent back injury. And he's had back injuries going back to like high school. So it's a recurring thing for him. It's a shame, but I was very surprised to see him make the 53 man roster. And I thought that he would be the guy moved off the roster when they brought in Witherspoon. But instead, like I said, it's Mondu, which kind of surprised me because I thought the whole reason that they were carrying the extra defensive lineman was due to the two it injury. Like when I saw that they were carrying eight defensive linemen on the 53 to start, I was like, oh, wow, that's kind of odd. But then like thinking back, it's like kind of expecting two it to go on mm-hmm. IR to start the year. Yeah. Um, so it kind of makes sense. But yeah, the fact that UG3 is still on this roster right now is definitely a surprise for me. Um, you know, also Josh Dobbs not getting cut because he's on IR. 
The last thing I want to talk about with the roster is just the Antoine Brooks situation too. You know, it's such a like how do you he comes into the year or comes into preseason as like the guy in the slot. Like penciled in as the starter. Um, we know that they like their molds, right? He fits that exact same type of mold as Mike Hilton. Gets leapfrogged essentially on the depth chart because of injury by Arthur Millette. Arthur Millette also got hurt, cut, and now he's back. Yeah. Um, but for Antoine Brooks Jr., just for a guy that came in penciled in as the starter to now not even be on the roster, I just saw he signed yesterday to the Rams practice squad. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just what a fall for him. And it's just, it's a shame, but it's a cliche. Best ability is availability. He was not available for this team at all. Yeah, that's what stinks. Is that every, I feel like a lot of people were shocked whenever he was cut. And I'm like, if you really think about it, it makes sense. In the preseason, whenever you're fighting for a job, if you're not going to play, you're not going to get the spot. And what value to the team are you if you're injured, especially if you're fighting for one of those spots? It's not like this is a guy like a Zach Banner, for example, who has been injured and hasn't really practiced that much. But we know he's going to be with the team. So mm-hmm. they're not going to cut that guy. Arthur, or not Arthur Millette, he's the other one. Antoine Brooks Jr. was not that type of guy. It's who we wanted to be that slot corner moving forward, but it's just a crappy situation for him. It is. Speaking of crappy situations, we're going to wrap up the show talking about the way that the Pirates season is going to come to an end. Is there anything there with Mitch Teller to monitor? What are we looking forward to as the season wraps up? All that and more when we wrap up here at Around the 412 on the DK Pittsburgh Sports Podcast Network. Part of DK Pittsburgh Sports Podcast Network. I'm Smitty. He is Tyler. Let's wrap this up talking about the Pirates. The Pittsburgh Pirates, whose season is dwindling down. We are in the last couple weeks. Um, I'm going to bring up something that we've talked about on here many times. Um, Maybe the most polarizing topic to talk about when it comes to the Pittsburgh Pirates. Mitch Keller. Yes. Mitch Keller, the once very promising prospect, top prospect in the organization, um, who for some... Keep stringing them along. Is there something there? Is there not anything there? Uh, where are you at with with Mitch Keller? Do you think that there's anything there going forward? Can he be part of the rotation next year, years beyond when this team is ready to compete? I am at the same place with Mitch Keller that I have been for the majority of this year. Um, and I was very outspoken about it about a month ago on our show. Heck no. He is just terrible. I, I think the, the, the thing is his in- inconsistency. Yeah. He'll have one good start, that which, like you said, it just strings people along like, okay, maybe he can be a starter. But the problem is you can't have one good start and then one bad start. You're kind of getting like a Jeff Locke scenario at that point. <laughs> just I, alternating, I th- yeah. Yeah, and I just think that Mitch Keller, he just can't figure it out. I don't know what it is because, like you said, he has the one start where he will pitch multiple innings and he doesn't really give up any runs, doesn't walk people. But then he'll have another start where he only pitches like two or three innings and he has like seven or eight hits, and he has like four or five walks. It's it's just very inconsistent with him. And if you want to be a starting pitcher, especially for where we think this team could be going, we think in a couple of years that this team could be pretty good. And if he's going to be in that starting rotation, he's going to need to figure it out because, I mean, we've got guys down in the minors like Quinn Priester, Ronzi Contreras, Miguel Yajure. We've got guys that we think are going to be good MLB starters. And if he wants to stay in this rotation, he has to get the consistency down. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you just have to revert him to a bullpen role and see what you have there. Well, that's what I was going to ask you about. But yeah, I think first and foremost, I just want to say, like, imagine if Mitch Keller did pitch well this season. Like going back to our Pirates preview episode, that was the one thing like I brought up right away that we were looking forward to. Like, even if the team's going to be bad, is Mitch Keller going to show you enough that he can be a piece of the rotation when this team is ready to compete? Um, and he clearly hasn't done that. Um, and now you're that's why I think like Quinn Priester is the most important prospect that we have in the system. Like even if he's not the number one prospect, where are you finding the arms at for the rotation when this team is going to be ready to compete? Because we know you look around the diamond, everything else seems to be in place as long as like a decent bit of those guys pan out. Not every one of them is going to, but as long as a decent bit of them pan out. Um, but where are they going to find enough arms for the rotation and even the bullpen? Like even the bullpen, it's like they got Bednar right now. Who else is part of that right now? Maybe it's Mitch Keller. Do you think Mitch Keller can maybe then make the transition to the bullpen and be a good arm there? I think it's worth trying because 
if you just keep going up with this starting role and the inconsistencies keep happening, I, I don't know how you justify throwing him out there every five days. You might as well see what you can get out of him for like maybe one, two innings. I mean, maybe he's a bullpen arm that if you need an extended amount of innings from a bullpen guy, that's the guy you go to. But I, I just don't think that he's going to work as a starter. The bullpen might work. And to answer your question about like where are these arms going to come from, I think at that point you're hoping that these prospects pan out, but then you're, the Pirates, we're hoping we'll be in a situation where okay we trusted you with getting the farm system where it is today and then when we're competing or hopefully competing I think you get to a point where okay what free agent signings are you doing are you going to make any trades instead of giving away your starting pitchers you're trading for a starting pitcher like yeah. what's it going to look like from that from Ben Sherrington but Mitch Keller for the future not a starting pitcher in my eyes. Well, I want to segue that into what you were just talking about outside the organizations, probably where that pitching is going to have to come from, whether that's at them actually spending in free agency um, or using, say, these guys do pan out around them. You're going to have some log jams there position wise. So maybe trade some position players for some pitching um, to really get those rotation pieces to maybe get some bullpen arms as well. But that's how they're going to have to do it. And I started to think about that. It's like we know. Yeah. Yeah. Nutting's wallet. They don't spend in free agency. But I started to really think about, you know, DK has thrown this around as well. Other people have said it too like do we really think Ben Sherrington is taking this job if he were going to be handcuffed and not be able to spend in free agency when this team was ready to compete like I think that they learned from that last window of contention 13 to 15 that 2016 cannot be the way that that goes down again you know when they're ready to compete they're going to have to spend in free agency a little bit and look at the Giants this year who are going to make the playoffs um they literally, their entire rotation is just guys they went out and got on like one year deals. Mm -hmm. Like we're not talking about, you know, them spending huge money in free agency, but like getting a guy like an AJ Burnett or getting a guy like a Francisco Liriano, whether that be in trade or free agency, like those two guys that changed the way that we looked at the rotation in 2013. Um, you know, that's going to have have to be the way for me that they do it because there's not enough arms in the system right now. Yeah, and I think there's a couple guys that are on the team right now that could still be in the pitching rotation whenever they are contending, like JT Brubaker. I think he's a guy that people are high yeah, on. Yeah, I, I still like him. I think that they should have shut him down for the season, though. Like, he is already he already maxed out his limits, like, or his innings limit by, like, many, several innings. Like, he has never pitched as many innings, even close to, as he has this year. He should have been shut down, like, a month ago. I agree with you. Um, but then another arm is uh, Stephen Brault. I think that he the only reason that he would be in the rotation lefty. is because he's a lefty. He's a lefty. And, yeah. and the Pirates, when you look at the rotation in the system, uh, there's really not many lefty arms. And yeah, it's so like it's like Dylan, you have to have one of them, and he's the only guy they really have that can be a starter. That Dylan Peters they brought in, he's made a couple starts since then. Like He's, he's a lefty. Mm -hmm. um, the other name that I will throw out there, what about... Bryce Wilson. He's a, not a left as a lefty, but he's yeah. a righty. Um, former pretty high prospect for the Braves came over in the Richard Rodriguez deal. Like, I don't know how much you've seen of him. I know he's injured right now as well. But is there something there with him you think maybe he could be a piece for them, not necessarily through that window of contention, but at least at the start as an arm? Well, I think that the Pirates are pr pretty much in a situation where they are in experiment mode. You can not, you're not contending yeah. right now, so you can just really throw anybody anywhere and see how it goes. Mm -hmm. So, if you want to see what someone has as a starter, then go for it. You're not expected to contend right now. And if you're, you're interested in seeing what they have, you might as well do it right now because you shouldn't be doing that while you're contending. So, if they want to find out what Bryce Wilson has as a starter, then go for it. Also, we should mention I didn't have this on the list, but Gregory Polanco finally out of the organization. There was some, yeah weird stuff that happened there, you know, where he was like originally put on waivers, but it was only like, he was still came back to the organization because nobody claimed him. He ended up starting like the very next day. It was just a weird situation. Now he is with the blue Jays on a minor league deal. I, I it's, it's such a shame. You know, the things, the way things went South after that 2018 season where he was playing very well and then got hurt. Like he's been an up and down guy throughout his entire career, but by all accounts, one of the best people on that team and in that clubhouse, great teammate, great person to the media. Like, especially once he really got comfortable speaking English mm -hmm. and doing more interviews. So I wish him all the all the best in Toronto. Um, I hope he ends up being on that major league club as they make their playoff push. Yeah, and it's kind of sad to see. Like, he was really the last piece from that playoff push from yeah. 2013 to 15 that was still here. And now all pretty much all those players are gone. Yeah, Chad was, Cole, longest tenure pirate. Yeah, that's it's pretty crazy because, I mean, even 14, Blanco was the longest tenure pirate. Mm -hmm. But... Yeah, it's sad to see he meant a lot to this organization. I know there was just such high expectations with him 
And I feel like those were never met, especially for the expectations set by Pirates fans themselves. We were talking about like this guy is going to be like the next like MVP of the league, and it just never panned out. <laughs> yeah, like I mean, he had some really good seasons, and like, you mentioned that 2018 season for the first half of the year he was stellar, but then he had that injury, and ever since then he's just really never been the same player. Right. The thing I want to mention too, just like tr- like the hype around Ray Ripon when he was coming up, like he created all that. They signed him as a 16 year old pitcher yeah real estate like he ended up transitioning to right field and creating his own hype as like a top prospect in the organization he wasn't supposed to be that guy so just wanted to say that real quick but to kind of transition here still talking about the pirates obviously as we wrap up here and around the 412 part of dk pittsburgh sports podcast network um what are we looking forward to the rest of the season you know like what what is there that, other than mitch keller finding out if there is anything there what else are you watching for okay like brian reynolds like it's obviously the easy answer yeah, brian hayes is hurt right now i think that they might as well just shut him down with the time that's left i mean what are you looking for honestly it's the same things that we've been looking for all year long we don't really care about the wins i mean they are what 13 losses away from 100 so maybe you see if they can keep it <laughs> under 100 i don't really the push, think that's the push for 100 happen. losses yeah so maybe that's a hope for Pirate fans to see if they can keep it one, under 100 losses. But really, I think you're just looking at some individual players to see how they perform. Like you said, Brian Reynolds, he's a guy that we've been watching all year. Extend the man already. Um, and then some uh, new emergences of like Hoy Park and Yoshi Sutsugo. I yeah. think those guys are fun to watch. Um, Colin Moran is back from injury finally. We haven't really brought that up on the show because we haven't recorded in a few weeks. Yeah. Um, and then... Continuing to watch Kevin Stallings be the best defensive catcher in the league. Jacob Stallings. Or Jacob Stallings. You mentioned Kevin, Kevin Stallings. Stallings. People aren't done. That's it. One His, episode and done. People yeah. are going to tune us out. Yeah, sorry. Jacob Stallings. <laughs> Kevin Stallings sucks. He, he sucked at Pitt, Pitt as head coach. So, uh, But yeah, his son, Jacob Stallings, best defensive catcher in the league. So continue to watch guys like, guys like that. But I mean, maybe David Bednar in the yeah, bullpen to continue so. to see if he can pitch well. But that's really it. You're really not expecting to see anything from this team except individual performances because we know they're not going to win. You mentioned Bednar. Yeah, I, I think like we don't like the, the title of closer because it's like, I'll go back to it again. The, the circumstance I always bring up, like your, your closer, your best relief pitcher that you put in that closer role, if you have the bottom of the lineup due up in the ninth inning, why are you so worried about him facing that just because it's the last three outs of the game? Like you got to be willing to use him in the eighth inning if that's where like the the – you know, the heart of the lineup is going to be batting. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah. Is he going to be like the back end arm, the staple of that bullpen for the future? Um, that is one of the things for me to watch down the stretch here. I'll just say there's so many guys that are like on the cusp of losing their 40 man roster spot because of all these guys that the pirates have won out and acquired and have to be on the 40 man rosters. Mm-hmm. Um, like, like a cool Tucker, like a Kevin Newman, like their jobs are not safe right now. And they very well could not be pirates when we open up next season. Honestly, I don't care. Like, like yeah, with I those guys, just, I've seen I've seen enough of those guys where what's the point of them being here? We're not good anyway. So why? Why are they here? They're not even good. Yeah. So so yeah. I would rather use the 40 man roster spots on guys we've acquired for trade that we need to see what these guys have. They're new to the system. These guys like Cole Tucker, Kevin Newman, they've been here for a long time. They've had their chance. They've had their spotlight in Pittsburgh. They need to get out of town now because we've got some new faces into the organization. The most intriguing thing for me is going to be after the season, the off season, the way that they treat it. Like you mentioned Stallings. Is he, you know, going to be part of I, I wanna see, at least for when Davis is like at his first major league spring training, I wanna see him have like some interaction with Stallings and be able to work with him a little bit. So I hope that Stallings is part of at least the short term future here, despite his age. He doesn't have that same mileage on his knees though, as most catchers that are his age. So like I'm fine with him sticking around for a little bit. The well, one for me that's like a complete wild card is Moran. Like, are they going to keep him? Yeah, honestly, I don't know because, like, at first base, I mean, technically, I guess you could throw anywhere. We've seen that over the past decade. We've seen multiple people play first Like Ben Gamble played first this year. Yeah, but Colin Moran has been pretty decent for the Pirates, so Mm -hmm. I think that you probably do keep him around at least into next year. And when it comes to Jacob Stallings, I I think that you have to keep him around, not only because he's a productive catcher, but looking at the system besides Henry Davis, like, what do they have at catcher? There's really not much there. Andy Rodriguez, who came over from the Yankees, they're talking about him potentially not even being able to stick at catcher and move into the outfield. And then you have Carter Benz, who they brought over in a trade and they really liked, but like he got off to a decent start and he's really struggling now. Uh, double a. So uh, yeah, I, I think that Stallings still has to be kept here because of that. And, and it's not just 
because of that. Like, it's not just because he has to. Like, he's still a very good player for them. I think he's going to be good for this pitching staff. Um, so, yeah, I would keep him around. It's, there's some of these guys that are just like, like Ben Gamble's not going to be back. Wilmer Deep is not going to be back. It's just going to be, you're, this is going to be a very different looking team, I think, next year. You might still see like them bring in guys like that, like the one year rental guys, because mm-hmm. it's still, we're not expecting the Pirates to be good next year. The last question that I have for you on the Pirates and to wrap up the show. This is another thing that we've brought up multiple times. I'll ask you again yeah. on here. Derek Shelton, who we both have said like we really don't feel like he's the manager of the future when this team is going to be in contention. We both liked the hire at the time and even like through the very rough 2020 season felt like he was the the perfect like blend, right? Of like a a player's coach, but also, you know, the bringing that old school feel to it as well. Like he's a good blend of of and we talked about this with Michael McHenry. Right. But do you still feel that same way? Like he's not going to be the manager when this team's contending? Absolutely not. I think that it's one thing to have a bad team and just to be losing games, but it's another to have that, but then in game you're making questionable decisions as manager. And mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of that. Like bringing in certain guys from the bullpen or leaving guys out there too long. I, I just think that he – has made so many questionable decisions this year that really just gives me no faith as him as manager moving forward. So I think for the for the next like year or two, he'll still be the manager. I think that he's going to be that until they are pretty much ready to contend, I guess I should say. Yeah. But I just don't think that he is the guy to, to really excel them when they are contending because of these things that I'm seeing when the team is bad. And if the team is bad and you're, these aren't the things that are going to change whenever the team is good. Yeah. Like it's I'm, not, it's not his manager decisions are not going to change all of a sudden because the team's good. He's still going to have the same philosophy. It's just, he has better players. Right. And that's the whole thing. It's like people that are defending him right now. It's like, you got to have the horses, you know, to be able, and, and we're not looking at the record though. Just like situationally, the things that he does. Um, I know he's no longer on the team, but I remember an instance like, the, the one that pops in my mind right away, Clay Holmes, um, a series out in Milwaukee, gave up like six runs in a relief outing one night. Derek Shelton goes back to him the very next night in that same series. Like, just situationally, I don't think he's a good manager. And I think that he would severely hamper an actually contending team. Like, right now, it's, it's meaningless. But he's auditioning, too in a way, to be the manager of this team going forward when they are in their window of contention. And he's just, for me, not passing that audition. So I th- I actually, I'll go on record right now saying this. People can dig it up in the future. I think next year is his last full season as Pirates manager. It could be. He might start the following season. I don't think that he ends up being the You know, I, I thought of this while you were just talking. Is I think the way that he handles his bullpen reminds me of the way Madden in Chicago handled oh, man. his bullpen whenever the the Cubs were like going on their World Series runs. They, especially, he, he almost lost in that World especially, Series. Yeah, the like, way that he handled Raldis Chapman, it's like it reminds me of the same things that Derek Shelton does. He either like leaves guys in too long or brings them in too late. Right. It just it's it's the tendencies in the situations that are the big red glaring marks not the not the losses we knew this team was gonna be bad it doesn't matter who we, the manager was we knew they were gonna be bad but i i don't think that he, did we say 100 losses i think that i did okay yeah. i said like 102 I think. yeah i thought that they had one more hot streak in them in september uh well i remember back in like april we were talking you're like do you think they get back over 500 and i'm like okay they play the reds and the <laughs> yeah, giants yeah. and then like the reds again or something like that and i was like yeah i think they get back and over at the 500. time they you haven't know, sniffed it since at the time the reds and giants those were like team like very winnable games we thought yeah, both those teams could, are going to be in the postseason potentially. So, yeah, I, I think I think that we we expected nothing from this team this year, and they're probably going to hit the hundred loss mark. I'm pretty sure I said 102 losses, so maybe they keep it under that. I'd like to see them keep it under 100. Like as much as I'd like them to be bad, just to get like the higher draft pick and everything. Yeah, like you don't want them to be embarrassing, but they have been so. Yeah, you gotta at some point you gotta start creating that culture. Like yeah. get these guys used to winning for when they are competing. Although so. then again, half the guys on this team aren't even gonna <clears throat> be here when that happens. Yeah, that's true. But for guys like Brian Reynolds, you know, T. Brian, guys that are going to be here that haven't sniffed being on a good team yet, like that stuff's important. So we shall see. We'll see if they come in uh at a hundred losses. Maybe they're right at a hundred losses. It's still possible. Over or under. We'll see. They got thirteen games. Yeah. Well, I think that about does it, unless you got anything else. Uh, no, I'm hoping the next time that we record, we see a TJ Watt signing. True. We're, we're still on watch for True. that. True. 
Very true. Um, I want to wrap up then with two more things. Uh, as we were recording, actually, here, I know this isn't going out for a couple of days from when we record, but um, Tun Chilkin, Steelers legend in every possible way, um, has passed away um, as of when we are recording this uh, episode. You know, it's hard to put into words what he means to the Steelers community, um, not just as a player, but for really everything that he's done post playing career. I, there's so many people like if you open up your Twitter app, you know, you'll just see the outpouring of support for his family and everybody saying rest in peace. And everybody's talking about the person he is not even the player and people talking about how they would listen to the radio as opposed to just listening to the audio on TV just to be able to hear his voice mm-hmm. along with Hillgrove and even going back to like Myron Cope. You know, yeah. so um, there's really not much more than I can say that anybody else isn't saying. But I would be remiss if we didn't at least, you know, pass along our condolences for Tom Shelton and just, you know, everybody needs to remember him. And he's going to be remembered by everybody in the Steelers community. Yeah, he's a Steelers legend. It's a shame that it happened. It was, but um, it's it's nice to see that everybody in this community, we've seen it already looking on Twitter when it happened, that everybody's like rallying around it and uh, showing their support for him and his family. And people that have nothing to do with the Steelers either. Yeah. Like, you can tell that these people just cross paths just as like reporters or analysts or, you know, radio voices, whatever it might be, because like Josh gets off putting something out, you know, and, and that's just one example. But like people that cover the Pirates, Nesbitt, Stephen Nesbitt, mm-hmm. um, you know, everybody, just an outpouring of support, like you said, and it's just great to see. Um, but yeah, rest in peace, Tunch Elkin. Our thoughts are with his family. Um, Going to be missed especially on those broadcasts. Um, on a happier note, to wrap things up, Rockin' Around the 412 is launched. Um, that is our pinned tweet on Twitter, at Around the 412, you can find us. You'll find all the information right there. This is year four of doing it. We've raised just over $10,000 in the previous three years. That money goes directly, every single penny, to families in the area uh, to help out at Christmas time. That's toys, clothes, electronics. Every family last year got a Nintendo Switch, yeah. uh, which is crazy, thanks to you guys donating the money. Um but literally everything that they could possibly want, we they ha- make their Christmas list, they give it to us, we go out and get the stuff, deliver it to them, and provide Christmas in its entirety with the money that's left over. We give the family a gift card to go out and get groceries for uh, to, to make a Christmas meal, if you will, as well. So, um, But other than that, yeah, you can find all that information on our Twitter. It's our pinned tweet. Other than that, thanks for listening to Around the 412, brought to you by DK Pittsburgh Sports Podcast Network. I'm Smitty. He is Tyler, and we'll talk to you next time. Until then, bye-bye.